in your Bibles this morning. First John chapter number four. We'll start there and then we'll look at quite a few things today. As we looked last week at the, let me look back at the notes and make sure I get them right. At the holiness of God a few weeks ago, the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the wrath of God. But aren't you glad also for the love of God? I'm glad he's not just a God with wrath and justice and holiness and all these things. I'm glad he's also a God of love, not just of love, but God is love. So thank you for that. If you check your phones, please make sure on sign it. That'd be greatly appreciated. And also, if you would, uh, I know the Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But anytime we lose a loved one, we, we go through sorrow. Uh, so please pray for the Blake family. Pastor Stan Blake, Pastor at Good News for Do you know how long they were there? 30 years or something like that at Good News. And just in faithful, faithful servants of God. Mrs. Blake had cancer uh, and God called her home yesterday morning. So be in prayer for the Blake family, if you would, please. Just a precious family, a sweet, sweet lady, and uh, kept Brother Blake in line most of the time. We're so thankful for Brother Blake. He, uh, he, and without, without Mrs. Blake, Brother Blake wouldn't have been able to accomplish what God did in his life. But just pray for that family, if you would, please. And uh, I asked, uh, uh, also Pastor Hogue texted me yesterday to let me know about it, and asked him if he'd please let me know about funeral arrangements if they're allowing a public funeral. I don't know what's going on still in things today. So if that becomes available to me, those that knew the Blakes, I'll do my best to pass the news along if they're allowing a funeral for that. So, but be in prayer, please, for uh, the Blake family. <clears throat> uh, God's love, the love of God, as we look, continue on the, the landmarks of Baptist doctrine. Uh, I'm glad for the love of God. First John chapter four, verse seven and eight. First John four, seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 9, 2, And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Father, thank you for your word, and ask us, help us today. We ask you to help us today as we look into your word. To help us to better understand the love of God. Lord, as you've told us, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Help us learn to love the way that you have loved. Help us to learn better about the love of God. And know that you'd use this Sunday school lesson today to uh, change our lives, draw us closer to you. Help us to get a better understanding of your love for us so that we can love each other and this lost and dying world even more. We're thankful for your goodness to us. Please bless the Sunday school hour in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> The love of God, the meaning of God's love. Love is that attribute of God by which God is eternally moved uh, to, to communicate with mankind. Here's a quote. I wish I had written down who said it. But love is that attribute of God by which he is inclined to seek the highest good for his creatures and the communication of himself to them regardless of the sacrifice involved. A better way to explain that is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that we, we really can't understand that kind of love because we tend to love, uh, we tend to love the lovely and not just the lovely looking, uh, but the lovely, the nice people. They're easy to love. But God so loved the world. Real love is when we can love those uh, that despise us and pray for those which just, you know, use us and hurt us. Then we're beginning to show uh, it's hard enough for some church people to love the person across the room. Even though they f believe the same way and most of the time act the same way. Uh, and yet, and I hope that's not true here. I hope we, I hope we love one another. Pastor uh, that I know says this quite often. I feel the same way. He says the Bible tells us that we are to love one another. We're commanded to love each other but it never says we have to like each other. And he'll say this in the pulpit. There's people in this church I don't like. I love everybody, but there's people I don't like. And then he said the, the, you know, the insecure ones will come up and say, Pastor, is it me? Yep, it's you. But anyway, you know, we're not, we don't have to like each other. What do you mean like? We don't have to like the same likes. If a, if a person comes to church with a Raiders tie on, doesn't mean I have to like them or what they do. As I told him earlier, you know, the, the languages change over time in the English language. Uh, the word raider wasn't used in 1611. So they used the word reprobate in the word of God. So uh, if the word of God, 
No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't have to like everything everybody does. You don't have to like me, but we're to love one another. Just like God. Because why? Because that's a manifestation of God. God wants us. We're, we're predestined, not for salvation, but we're predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. God knew who was going to get saved. That doesn't, but we don't know, so we should be giving the gospel to everybody. But once we're saved, we're, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. And what is the image of His Son? That He died for the sins of all mankind. He is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Why? Because God so loved the world. And so we're supposed to love the same way. As we draw closer to God, as we're more in His image, we are to love the way God's, God loves. So the meaning of God's love is that it, we can't really fully comprehend that. We will when we're in heaven. Uh, but we ought to love. We ought to love those we ought to love those that hate God. We're living in a day where hatred towards God is becoming, it's always been around, but it certainly is becoming more and more uh, prevalent, more and more, uh, they are, the, the, those that hate God are becoming more aggressive in their hatred uh, and not hiding it whatsoever. Uh, we can take a cue from them and we ought to be loving God. We ought to be standing for God. We ought to be loving those uh, even that hate God, the meaning of God's love. Here, number next, how about the scriptural fact of God's love? Um, you're in 1 John. Look at 1 John 3.16 as the first verse we want to look at is, is John 3.16, which we know that verse. But how about 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 16? Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The scriptural fact of God's love is this, that God laid down His life for us, just like he told us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, he didn't give, he didn't give a created sacrifice to die for man's sins. Uh, we were dealing one time with, I think it was Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus died for your sins. They'll say that Jesus Christ died for your sins. But here's what they believe. They believe that God created Jesus to be a sacrifice for your sins. That's why it's interesting, the pastor of mine, I think his brother Wood, one time we were dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, and he said, it's interesting that you'd call yourself Jehovah's Witnesses when uh, we definitely have different doctrinal beliefs. He said, you think you're a witness of Jehovah, but my God, my Jehovah God loves me more than your God loves you. What do you mean by that? He said, your God created a sacrifice. My God became a sacrifice. It's easy to, to create a sacrifice, but when there's a big difference in creating a lamb to become a sacrifice or you yourself becoming a sacrifice. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Uh, that's the scriptural fact of God's love. 1 John 3, 16. We already read 1 John 4, 8 where God is love. Look at 1 John 4 and verse 16. The scriptural fact of God's love. Uh, the reason we want to... Did I mention we're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning? Okay, if I forgot to tell you, here we're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning. First John chapter number 4 and verse number 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So a couple times there in verse 8 and verse 16, God is love. The scriptural fact, it, doesn't, it isn't just that God has love, God is love. Um, which helps to squelch the idea of people that say God would never send anybody to hell. Yeah, you're true. God never has and never will send anybody to hell. God doesn't send them there. Our sin, and a person that is sinner that's never saved, uh, there. In fact, God so much doesn't want people to go to hell that the God that is love died in their place, so they don't have to go to hell because God is love. How about one more verse? Underneath that, Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 45. The scriptural fact that God is love. Matthew 5. Let's read verses 30, I'm sorry, 43 through 45. Here Jesus said, Matthew 5, 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you and do good. That'll be a verse, by the way, for our soul winners. When you're out knocking on a door, uh, remember that verse. 
Bless them that curse you. We had some yesterday, they didn't get to cursing, but they got not very happy about us coming by. Uh, and we have had some that you know, just slammed the door and all that. Bless them that curse you. Not just there, but other places in life. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. That ye may be the chosen of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. That's just a fact that God is love. God doesn't uh, choose and say, well, because you love me, I'm going to let your grass grow even higher. In fact, sometimes it seems like that those that hate God, their grass grows better uh, than ours does. Or they may be blessed more. We, we think that way. But God says, I'm going to treat everybody the same. I love everybody. I died for the sins of all mankind. The love of God, the scriptural fact of God's love. How about number two, the objects of God's love. You're there in Matthew. Go to chapter three, if you would, please. And verse number 17, the object of God's love. Uh, now we know that who it is that God loves, but the looking specifically at some of these, the objects of God's love, Matthew 3 and verse number 17, first of all, he loves his son, Matthew 3, 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well placed. John chapter five and verse number 20 also shows us that the son of God is the object of God's love, John chapter five. In verse number 20. John 5, 20, Jesus says, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. I want to pay attention to that first part. For the Father loveth the Son. And yes, it is okay to say loveth the Son. That's a continual, always does and always continues. The Father loveth the Son. How about one more in John chapter 17? The object of God's love is first of all, His Son. John 17, which John 17 is just a side note. A lot of people talk about saying the Lord's Prayer. Um, Matthew 6 is what they're referring to. I actually truly believe that Matthew 6 is the model prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, I believe, would be is the Lord's prayer. As Jesus facing death, getting ready for it, he was praying to the Father here in John 17. John 17, 23 and 24, we show how that the Father loves the Son. In them, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. We know the object of God's love, first of all, is his son. How about secondly, go to John 16 and verse 27. You're right there, John 16 and verse 27. Not only does God love the Son, God loves the believer. As we look at these things specifically, because it's easy to say that God loves the world, but how about we look kind of specifically that God loves His Son, God the Father loves God the Son, also God the Father loves the believer. John 16, 27, For the Father Himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I am come out from the Father. God loves the believer. You know how God manifests His love toward the believer? Look at that here in just a little while. When next time you get convicted about something, next time God uh, uh, punishes you for something you've done wrong, that's something that, that proves the love of God. And we're not thankful for it at the moment, or we should be. We've got to learn to be thankful for the manifestation of God's love. I'm getting ahead of myself already. So God loves His Son. Number two, God loves the believer. Number three, go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God loves the sinner. God loves the sinner. Again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And now that, that deals with obviously the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Then he goes individually that whosoever believeth in him. Please don't get sucked into the lie that, well, we're all God's children because God died for everyone. That's, that's false doctrine straight out of the pits of hell. Not everybody's a child of God. Those that get born again are a child of God. And so I don't know who came up with it, but a lot of celebrities have made it popular to believe, well, we're all God's children because God is love. Now, Jesus said, 
those that aren't, you're, a, you're of your father the devil, he was telling people. A person that's not born again is not a child of God. They're a creation of God, sure, but they're not a child of God. Only those that have been born again. That's why God, he said, I love the whole world. And then that whosoever, he died for the whole world, but whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So we know that he loves the sinner and not just the masses of the sinners, but the uh, individual sinner. And then Romans 5, 8 shows us again that God loves the sinner. Romans 5 and verse number 8. But God, look at verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. And there's kind of a, there's a period there. There's also a change in thought of where God's remark, the Holy Spirit of God is through the pen of Paul reminding us that we in this room would probably lay down our life for somebody. You know, those that have children, you, I think, would be willing to lay down your life for your children or your grandchildren or your parents, your siblings, things like that. People you know and love. And God said, yeah, that's of course, people will do that. But then he says, here's the difference between your love and God's love, verse number eight. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves the sinner. Now, he doesn't love the sinner enough to allow the sinner into heaven without being born again. But he loved him enough to die for the sinner. God loves the object of God's love is his son. The object of God's love is the believer. And the object of God's love is the sinner. Not just the object of God's love, but how about the manifestation of God's love? How about John 3, 16? We can, read, can we read that one? I keep bringing that up because I, I don't want it to become, oh, well, that's John 3, 16. We already know that. Familiarity. Have you heard that term? Familiarity breeds contempt. You get so used to hearing something that it doesn't mean a lot anymore. John 3, 16, we hear it so often. We've quoted one of the, probably the second most quoted uh, portion of the Word of God. The 23rd Psalm, I think, is the most quoted. Then John 3, 16, very close behind that. Well, I know that verse. Yeah, well, let's remember how important that verse is. The manifestation of God's love in John 3, 16. It was manifest through Christ's suffering on the cross. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. Which reminds me that you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You know how I know you can love without giving? Uh, because in about six months or so, seven months, we're in the fifth, yes. In about six and a half to seven months, there'll be a guy or a lady standing outside of Walmart with a bell and a bucket. And ringing the bell. Ding, ling, ling, ling. And people that don't love that person or even care about the Salvation Army, they'll throw change in there. Just proving you can give without loving. But you cannot love without giving. And I'm not saying don't throw your money into the Salvation Army thing, but I know of another place that has a bucket that you can throw your change into. So just keep that in mind. If you've got change you want to get rid of, I know where that can go. Well, you're after our money? Next time, if yell at me, next time also yell at the Salvation Army guy uh, with the bell too. Um, anyway, what I'm saying is we know that. The people we love, we give toward. We give our time. I may not be able to give them money or give them things, but we give to those we love. The manifestation of God's love, he gave his life on the cross. The manifestation number two, we see in Isaiah 55, 7. He manifested his love in offering a full and complete pardon. A full and complete pardon. I've never been in this situation to where I've needed, as far as on this earth, now I needed the pardon of sin, but I've never had to stand before a judge and hear him say pardon. I've never had to worry about the governor pardoning me over anything, or I don't think the current governor would pardon me over anything. Uh, I've never had to have the president pardon me over anything, but I have had God pardon me. And I, I would imagine if I was standing in front of a judge on this earth, the greatest thing I could hear is a full and complete pardon. Somebody paid for your mistake or your whatever, and you are pardoned from it. Even better than that is the fact that God did that. In Isaiah 55 and verse 7, God gave a full and complete pardon. Verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
and let him return unto the Lord, and he'll have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He will abundantly pardon. I'm glad that God offers a full and complete pardon uh, for my sins. Not only that, he manifests his love in ministering to his own. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. Did I say 2? Deuteronomy 32. Sorry, I confused myself even on that one. Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 through 12. The Word of God tells us this. For the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is a lot of His inheritance. He found him in a desert land in the waste hollowing wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of His eye, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttering over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings taketh them, bearing them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there is no strange God with him. What a great picture of God as he's telling us how that the, the mother eagle and all takes care and all that. That's how God loved. He manifests his love toward us in the fact that he cares for his own. I know that here he's talking about the children of Israel, but he does the same thing for us. Uh, that have been born again. He takes care of us as uh, he, he worries over us. He loves us as uh, the great picture here. He manifests his love toward us. Not only that, but Hebrews chapter... Now, we can be thankful for that, but how about Hebrews chapter 12? Something else we ought to be thankful for. I made mention of this earlier, how that we ought to be thankful that God manifests his love toward us in chastening his children. In chastening his children. Um, one of the worst things we can do for our kids is just to always let them do whatever they want to do. We need to chasten our children now and then. Um, some, it's, it's funny because some kids learn quick and some like getting whoopings. You can't say that anymore. Yes, I can. Some like getting whoopings. Will you abuse your children? No, I don't. Amen. And, and I, my parents did not abuse me. I may or may not have been one of those that liked whoopings. I'm not stubborn. I'll argue with you for 10 hours on how not stubborn I am. <laughs> but God chastens his children. Just like it mentions that we ought, we ought to be thankful. Let's just read what the Word of God says. God manifests his love in chastening his children. Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 11. Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Hang on, put your finger right there and hold on for a minute. Um, really, really uh, bothers me, I don't know if it's the right way to say it, when a person says they're born again, they live in sin forever, and they say they're never convicted about it. Oh, it doesn't bother me to do that. Well, when I, I got born again when I was nine years old. I'd like to say I lived a great, clean life my entire uh, life. There was a time in my life I was stupid and rebellious enough to do what I wanted to do. My father was telling me to do one thing. I was doing something else. I was under extreme conviction. God whooped me upside, up one side and down the other. That was one of the things as I was dealing as a young man with uh, you know, the, the assurance of my salvation. I don't know if all church kids are this way, but I certainly was. You know, I believe I got saved as a young man and then back and forth and not sure. And God, if I didn't mean it then, I mean it now. One way God really helped me is when I was in sin, he was chastening me. And if I wasn't his child, he wouldn't be chastening me. But because I belong to him, so I learned to be thankful for the chastening of God because one thing it certainly helped me realize is he loves me because I'm, now he loves me because I'm part of the world. He loves me because I'm a sinner, but he really loves me because I'm his child. And he proves that by chastening me. Somebody that's not saved, lost people out doing what lost people do, they may know that it's wrong, but they're not being chastened by the Holy Spirit of God. God's children will. Now, I'm not saying that, well, a saved person can't go out and get drunk. Yes, they can. A saved, don't, a saved person can't do this. Yes, they can. But they will be under conviction about it. Here's the thing. Now, here, I'm not preaching. I'm teaching a Sunday school lesson this morning. However, however, 
well, a, a saved person can't go out and get drunk. Yes, they can, but when they, when they uh, open that first whatever drink, the Holy Spirit of God is all over them. And then it, after they do the next one, the ne or whatever it is, they begin to quench the Holy Spirit. And what that does, it, God's still there, but it's building up that callus on their heart. And, I eventually, and then God has to start whooping even harder, and we don't really want that. But I'm thinking, what I'm just saying is, if you get out there and do that, and you're a born-again child of God, God will chasten us. And by the way, be thankful for it. We'll read on. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with, dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. And I like the, com the comma there before it says, and we gave them reverence. Because I think that comma means later on down the road. How many in this room, please show of hands, how many of this room right after uh, you had the Board of Education applied to the seat of knowledge. Right as soon as that happened, you stood up and said, thank you. <laughs> Hardly anybody ever did that. But then we grew up, and especially once we started having children, so thankful that our parents uh, whooped us the way they should have. And, and so we're thankful later on, he gave, we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. What does that mean after their pleasure? Because they, they whipped us when we messed up in the grocery store because they don't want to be, they, they want pleasure in growing, going to the grocery store. They don't want to be known as parents of a bunch of brats. So sometimes parents, we, we, chastise our kids because for our pleasure so we don't look like a bunch of useless parents or whatever the case may be but God does it for our profit now obviously parents we we uh, correct our kids and discipline them uh, for their good but really sometimes it is for our profit but really God does it for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness verse 11 and 12 now no chastising no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised by. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. I'm glad that God chastens his children. That's how he manifests his love toward us. And then Isaiah 63, 9. One more verse under this thought here. Isaiah 63, 9. God manifests his love toward us in his co-affliction with the oppressed. What do you mean by that? Let's read Isaiah 63 in verse number 9. Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, he remembered them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. The New Testament says it this way, that he, um, we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the fittings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. So he, he, uh, his co-affliction with the oppressed, he knows what we're going through. He knows. He manifests his love toward us in things like this. In Exodus 3, I have seen their affliction. I have heard their cry by the reason of taskmasters. He said, I know their sorrows. That's how God, he's a, he, he understands what we're going through. Because we can go, people in this room, people in this church have been through some things that I cannot relate with. But God can relate with everything you've been through. Take it to him and ask him, God, I've been through this. Can you help me with it? And yes, he can, because we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the fittings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. Everything we're, we have to face in this life, the love of God can help us through it because he's been through it, the manifestation of God's love. How about number next, the quality of God's love, the quality of God's love. First of all, in Zephaniah, that's a good one, Isaiah, Jeremiah, somewhere between Isaiah, you're in Isaiah now, somewhere between there and Matthew, you'll find the book of Zephaniah. Or in the very front page of your Bible, you'll find 
where the book of Zephaniah is. Zephaniah 3 and verse 17. Preacher, why do you go through all these? Because for some of us, that's the only time we'll ever read in the book of Zephaniah is if the preacher says, open to the book of Zephaniah. It's in there. It's not like the book of Hezekiah. Okay, Zephaniah is in the Bible. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. We want to say behind this, under the quality of God's love, it is complacent. The Lord thy God is in the midst of, I'm sorry, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Well, what a great verse there. And, and that verse like that ought to encourage us to read through the minor prophets more often. What a great verse. We thought verses like that only exist in the New Testament. But no, they're in the Old Testament as well, even in these prophets that are hard to find. What I'm saying by it's complacent is God is with us. He will save us. He rejoice with joy. He will rest. He will joy over thee. In other words, he knows he's there with us. We're not going through these things alone. Why? Because God is love. It's not just complacent, but number two, it's compassionate. It's compassionate. Isaiah 63. Isaiah chapter number 63 and verse number 9. Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old, I've already read that verse, but it certainly fits here. It is compassionate. How about John 17? It's affectionate. John chapter 17. The quality of God's love. It is affectionate. John 17. In verse number John 17, 23, where Jesus says again, "In I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and thou hast and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. It is affectionate. God shows his love toward us. Not only that, but Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, it is benevolent. Luke 6, 35, it is benevolent. <laughs> Showing your love toward others is what we're thinking about being benevolent. Where I read this verse in another portion of Scripture, we read in Matthew earlier, where Jesus said, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. God's love, the quality of God's love. Number five, it is merciful. Let me read Isaiah 55 and verse number seven. There the Bible says this, Isaiah 55, seven. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and unto our God for he will abundantly pardon. It is merciful. If you're still in John, go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John four nineteen. The love of God is also uninfluenced. The love of God is also uninfluenced. We know love here on this earth is influenced. You know how we know that? Because we just recently had Valentine's Day. And it's, in, you know, I know it's influenced because, man, the Hallmark and, and the flower growers make a lot of money on, on Valentine's Day because people are trying to influence somebody to love them. Hey, boy. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think this ought to be a good practice Men, it's a good place to say amen. Ought to be a good practice for a lot of men to uh, do things like this whenever I, because my, right now my wife uh, doesn't work outside the home. Um, and so she has no way of, of income. Now she sells things on eBay now and then. Kid, uh, kids that grow out of clothes? No, wait, she doesn't sell the kids. She sells the clothes, although, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we'd pay somebody every now and then to take the kids. The clothes the kids grow out of, things like that. But every now and then, but I, I have an income. I go work, and every now and then I get a chance uh, to do side jobs and whatnot. I'm for the pots, you know what I'm talking about. I don't ever have to look for work. Work finds me, and I have 
I have to learn to turn it down every now and then. And when I do that, a lot of times what I'll do is, is I'll give my wife, you know, some of the money, whatever I can, or on my normal paychecks, I give, I give her a certain amount and I tell that's for her to spend. That's not for bills. That's not for buying things for the kids. That's for Marsha. I think that's a good idea for men to do. And when I do it, I just kind of jokingly, I give it to her every week. I tell her, here, this is your, I'm paying you to like me money. Sort of joking when I say that, but um, the love of God is not influenced that way. Oh, God loves me because I give so much to Him. God loves me because I. He look how lucky He is to have me. No, the love of God is uninfluenced. First uh, John four and verse nineteen. We love Him because He first loved us. We didn't got to buy Him roses or flowers or candy or give him money to have him like us. No, he loved us. The reason we love him is because he first loved us. It's uninfluenced. We don't have to do things to make him like us. Not only that, but the quality of the love of God is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 19. Ephesians three nineteen. His love is infinite. Ephesians 3 and verse number 19. It is infinite, verse uh, Ephesians 3, 19, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye, may be, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. As we look at the love of God, we can learn more about it, but we can never understand the love of God. That doesn't mean we should avoid it or not study it more. We should, but it's, according to the word of God, it passeth knowledge. You know what else passeth knowledge? The peace of God. In the peace which passeth all understanding. So we, God is a God that we can't understand all that He does. We can't understand His love. It is infinite. Not only that, but it's immutable. What does that mean? That never changes. How about Romans chapter number 8? Nothing can change the love of God. Romans chapter number 8, verses 35 through 39 show us that God's love is immutable. Or we say it this way, it never changes. Also, let me read for you as you're turning to Romans 8, uh, John 13, and verse number 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, did he leave anything out that could separate us? I think he covered it pretty well. <clears throat> That's also another great verse to go with people that think you can lose your salvation, which is an ignorant term to use anyway, because I can lose my phone. I have lost my phone. I can lose my debit card. I've lost it. I can lose my mind. I'm losing it. What are those things? It, those are things that I possess, and it's up to me. It's up to me to remember my phone. I got, I got to work one day, and I have this phone. I have my work phone. I had them both uh, usually grab them and take off. So I'm, I'm, at, I'm at work, and I walk in and told my boss, hey, I don't got my phone today, so if you got to get a hold of me, too bad. No big deal. And then I'm driving down the road an hour or two later, and I open my lunchbox to get a snack out, and there's my phone's. I thought I'd lost them, but there they were. It's up to me to keep track of this thing. It's up to me to keep track of my insulin and stuff. I lose that quite often. I tell my kids, it'll be funny what you guys can't ever find that you're always having your kids look for. Because when I was growing up, here it was. Have you seen my glasses? All the, almost a daily basis, my dad's yelling, have you seen my glasses? I know now it's his glass, but have you seen my glasses? And so now my, my thing, I have that little bag that has my glucose monitor and my insulin. I just call it my machine. 
Almost every day I'm telling my kids, have you seen my machine? I lose those things. They're up to me to keep track of. Someday my kids will have something they can't ever find. It'll be the same thing over and over again because it's hereditary. Anyway, what I'm saying is these things are ours to keep track of, and we have to keep them, but our salvation is not up to us to keep, so we can't lose it. Does that make sense? We're kept by the love of God. Oh, and by the way, nor high... Uh, Persuade that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, uh, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Once we're born again, the love of God is always, it's immutable, it never changes. And then lastly, um, it is holy. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 6. God's love is holy. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 6. Think about it this way. God's love is not regulated by passion or sentiment, but by principle. God will not wink at sin, as he says in Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourge every son whom he receiveth. But God's love is pure and unmixed without any kind of sentimentality. What we're saying is God loves us all, and just because... <laughs> Uh, just how's that song say he loves me like I was his only child we're out soul winning one day and somebody had the back of their window it said God loves all his children but I'm his favorite I don't know about that uh, maybe that person was getting whipped a whole lot more than the rest of us God loves us the same his love is holy he's promised to love everyone and that's again that's why um, his love as far as forgiving sins for if, if we say we have no sin, we're, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, forgive us of all sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We understand that, that man, everybody that sinned, that's born again, comes to God. He forgives our unrighteousness. But also His love is just in this, that He died for the sins of all mankind. How just would the love be if, if it was true that I'm not part of the elect, and so I come to God and say, God, please forgive me my sins because you're the God of love. Nope, sorry, I'm not going to do that. No, a just God would say, everybody that wants to be born again, he that cometh to me, I want no wise cast out. Whosoever, God's love is just. The manifestation and quality of God's love. Aren't you thankful for the love of God? Next week we'll begin on the mercy of God. I'm thankful for God's love. I'm also thankful for his mercy. And as you've seen this morning, we use some of the same verses over and over again, but I guess that's okay, right? Uh, we can memorize those verses too. The, the same verse teaches us so many different things. Have you ever read a verse, got something out of it, and then months later or a day later, read that same verse and something else is like, wow, I didn't see that in there. Or you've read it many, many times. Oh, wow, I didn't know that was in there. It, it was already there, but that's because the Word of God is quick and powerful. Because it, you know, you could read Shakespeare ten thousand times. I don't know why you would, but you could read, or, you know, a, a more spiritual one. You could read Lewis Lemoore hundreds of times. I've, I think I've read them all. I can pick them up and just flip like that and skim through them all, and I already know what's going to happen. When the guy's going to get shot and all this, and none of his guys ever die, so I know he's not. Anyway, I know all this, but I, when I read it, I always it's the same thing over and over again. It's always the same. Never anything new. I'm not saying there's new things in here, but there's truths I've never seen, even on verses I've read over and over and over again. And I'm thankful that God does that for us. I'm thankful for His love uh, in, in my life. I'm thankful for His mercy as well. We'll look at that next week. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and ask you to help us uh, to, today, God, to understand better the love of God. Help us, Lord, in the 11 o'clock hour. Pray you'd meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>